Welcome to the New Abbey YouTube channel. We are a Jesus community telling the biggest story of God in Los Angeles, and we're excited that you're joining the conversation with us today. Enjoy. Uh, at New Abbey, we believe in conversations. Uh, we believe in hearing from one another. Uh, I believe that God is working and moving within each and every one of us. And so we have conversations to hear that. So we have a light conversation for you to start with today, uh, which is, what do you want freedom from? Find three or four strangers around you and tell them your deepest, darkest secrets. Enjoy. In 2007, my wife and I spent a month in South Africa, and we were in Cape Town. And in Cape Town is Robben Island, which is off the coast, where apartheid South Africa kept any of their political adversaries. It's the place where Nelson Mandela was kept, in many of, one of many prisons, for 27 years. And I think about that, that in the world that we live in, we love social justice, we want to see freedom, we want to see liberation, and I think we see somebody like a Nelson Mandela, and I think, I don't actually want to do that. I want liberation. I want to see that freedom. I want other people to experience justice. If push came to the shove, do I want to spend 27 years in prison? And I think that when we see the Nelson Mandelas of the world, they are the true heroes. The people who sacrificed, who had a vision of faith that something could be better that there could be a world where apartheid South Africa didn't continue to segregate and oppress black people. And the beauty of the stories of Nelson Mandela is that these are people who they didn't have any certitude for the dreams that they had. But they chose to keep moving in faith. They chose to believe, to hope, to live in action and in practice that through their faith, through their belief in who God is, through their belief in what humanity can be, that they were willing to sacrifice it all because freedom is something that we all want. Nelson Mandela wrote this incredible autobiography uh, that I got to read in college, and I would recommend reading it. It's called The Long Walk to Freedom because freedom is that. Freedom is not something that's just stagnant. Freedom is a journey, is an adventure. It is a process. It will take time. Freedom is not the story that we were given maybe in previous arenas of faith where you just simply come to the altar, you pray the prayer, and magically everything is fixed. No, freedom is an invitation to begin something, to continue on from something, to keep going towards something, that in every evolution, in iteration of who you are as a human being, that you'll experience more and more depths of freedom. But true freedom is not just our ability to experience it. True freedom is when we now have the ability to offer others freedom as well. And so today, I want to talk about faith is freedom. And to do that, we're going to talk about some things. We're going to talk about the anti-hero, and if we can talk about the anti-hero, then we have to talk a little bit about some responsibility. And if we can understand responsibility, then dot, 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 said, which is the Hebrew understanding of the word for Lord, that the Jews would never say the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that they would keep the name sacred. So we're going to talk about what that means in Genesis as we're there. And then if we can do that, then we can talk about what we want freedom from. And if we can talk about what we want freedom from, in Kanto, my friends. Here you go. Yes, yes. I knew that would get somebody excited, right? Is anyone, has everyone seen this movie? If you have not, this is your job in life. It is beautiful. I know that I am a parent now because I don't know anything cool about music in the world, like nothing. Like, but what I do know is that I'm hanging out with a bunch of parents the other day, and all of a sudden is, we don't talk about broom. No, 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 right? And all the parents start chiming in. I'm like, oh, this is my life now. <laughs> Oh my God, I haven't been to the Hollywood Bowl. Is that a thing still? Or like the, or I don't know. But I got Disney Plus, my friends. So if we're going to talk about Encanto, then Lake Leica. And if that, all peoples. And if we can talk about all peoples, then we'll think about what it means to be some co-architects in this world. So we've been in the Torah, and we're in Genesis. Again, the Torah is just the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're going to spend all of 2022 looking at these big stories from the Torah that I believe that these stories of faith 
shape us who we are as human beings, that these stories still have some umph to them, that they still have a little bit of uh, magic to them, that they still have some power that says something into the world, that they've lasted this long, that they've lasted for thousands of years because these words and these narratives still have the power to liberate human beings to be the fullest potential of who they are. And the liberation of human beings, as the Torah would see it, is the responsibility of humanity intersecting with relationship with God. And that when those things come together, that there's real magic in the world. And so I want to talk about this idea that faith is freedom. Now, for many of us, faith was terrifying. For many of us, the story we were told, faith was fear. Faith was being scared of something. Faith was rapture. Faith was hell. Faith was worrying about all of the things. Faith was, I'm not good enough. I know there was other good stuff in there. I'm not trying to trivialize or bring it down, but there was a lot of that tied up in the message. But the story of gospel, the story of Jesus, the story of Torah is the story is faith is liberation. Faith is salvation. Faith is you becoming all that you've ever wanted to become. Faith is all people living into a different perspective. Faith is all people having a greater reality. Faith is the kingdom of God. Faith is these bigger things and bigger stories. That's what faith is. And faith is freedom. It should free us into a greater reality. It should free us into a different type of humanity. And so the story of Abraham is one of those stories. Follow along with me in Genesis as we talk about this story of faith. Genesis 12 says this, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. What's interesting about the story of faith of Abraham is that Abraham is somewhat of an anti-hero in this world. Now we have heroes, but our heroes wear capes, and our heroes have superpowers. In the ancient world, the heroes were the people that you made statues about because they conquered other empires or other peoples. But the Torah is unique and revolutionary that the stories of heroes in, in these, in these uh, stories are people who are old who were barren, who had nothing to offer, who thought that they couldn't be a hero. That it was revolutionary, and it was saying this, that the heroes of this world aren't just the top 1% who have everything. What if the heroes can be anybody? What if God wants to bring freedom to the lowest of the low to show the highest of the high what it actually means to be human? That what if this anti-hero actually has something to teach the empires? Because maybe the story of the empires isn't the narrative that needs to be ruling your life. That Abram was this different type of anti-hero, that he was given an invitation to experience God in a different way. As we look to the other stories of Genesis before, Abram is a juxtaposition of some other things. You may have remembered these stories. We had Adam and Eve, everybody's favorite button, belly buttonless people on planet Earth. We had Cain and Abel, family drama. We had Noah. Stories you should never tell children, by the way. And then we have the story of the Tower of Babel. The rabbis will talk about these stories in this way. The rabbis will try to move us away from this idea that it was a fall or there was original sin or depravity, things like that. That's not a Jewish way of thinking. I always tell people that you need to know that because that's not how Jesus thought about you. If Jesus thought about you as being depraved and the only reason he came is to deal with the belly buttonless sin that happened thousands of years ago, you think he would have just mentioned it one time, but he never talks about it. Why? Because Jesus is trying to bring you freedom. Jesus is trying to bring you kingdom. Jesus is trying to offer you a salvation and liberation that actually works for all of humanity. He's not bringing you a story of fear. And so the story that the rabbis will talk about with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and Babel is that these are stories of responsibility. That for Adam and Eve, theirs was personal responsibility. If you remember in the story, after they ate the fruit, what did everybody do? They did it. Oh, what a human way of living. Oh, I don't want to take ownership for this thing. I want to point my responsibility over there. 
For Cain and Abel, it was a story of moral responsibility. If you remember Cain's words, I am not my brother's keeper. It's a story about the responsibility of anger and rage and what that means to us. And guess what? When you're a little kid, hopefully you have good parents who provide boundaries around you because you have tantrums. I, no one? No one ever had tantrums? I still have tantrums. My kids have tantrums all the time. And we need boundaries to help us provide and regulate and learn responsibility in a new way of being. The story of Noah was social responsibility. I love that the rabbis will critique Noah. Right? We'll talk about Noah as this person of faith who walked with God, all of these things. But the rabbis will say, don't you find it weird that Noah never said to God, wait a minute, you want to kill the whole world? And you want just me and some animals to go two by two in the ark? That's an odd thing to request of me, God. Because Abraham will have a similar moment where God wants to like, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's like, ah, let's do a little bargaining here, me and you, Yahweh. Let's talk about this thing. What if there's just 50 righteous people? God's like, all right. And Abraham gets them down to five. And so they look at Abram as this juxtaposition to a person of faith, as somebody who takes personal responsibility, as somebody who lives throughout moral responsibility, as somebody who takes social responsibility for what's going on in the world, that Abram isn't just here about saving himself and his select family, that Abram wants to make sure that the whole world gets blessed as well. And so we have this anti-hero at the heart of what the Torah is for a reason. And then the story of Babel is this like universal responsibility, which is asking these bigger questions in the world, like just because you can, should you? And maybe we need to ask bigger of those questions in the world today. So this idea of responsibility is wrapped up in those first 11 chapters in the Bible. That's Hebrew or English, I don't know, enjoy. Respons- responsibility, my friends. That part of faith, one part of it, is the responsibility of human beings. That we have a part to play in this story. I kind of grew up in a world where I had no part to play in the story. Jesus took it all, and now you just sit here and like wait around, I guess? And there was other moments where I was asked to participate things, but it felt like an arbitrary list of morality that I was trying to keep or not keep versus an invitation into great responsibility for how the cosmos work themselves out. Great responsibility over my personal life, over society, over the way that I engage other people. Great responsibility for growing up and evolving. This is the Jewish way of thinking. The other side of faith is it's not just humanity and our responsibility. Oh yeah, there's God. How many times do you feel like we have these conversations and sometimes you're like, oh, there's a missing character and I think God is that missing character. That we need God in this story. You are here on a Sunday morning in Los Angeles in 2022 in a CrossFit gym. This was a part of you that wants to connect with God. There's an intersection for your life where you want God to send you, to lead you on an adventure, that you want to do great things in this world and that you need faith, that you need something beyond yourself. Because you have succeeded. You have had moments where good things have worked out for you, and you have had moments where things have been difficult, and where it hasn't worked out, and where it's been painful. And you know just from your experience as a human being that I can give fully my part, but there's also times where I need something to give fully beyond me because I just can't always do it. And that's the intersection that we live into and the responsibility of this story. The Bible will talk about it in a really interesting way. In that first verse in Genesis, it says this, the Lord said to Abram. Now, in those words there, the Lord, it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the name for Yahweh. Now, what's powerful about that is that's the most personal and relational name that we have in the Hebrew Torah about who God is. In fact, in Genesis 1, when God creates the entire cosmos, there's no word for Yahweh in there. The word for God in that story is this word for Elohim. Say Elohim with me. You are proficient at Hebrew. Elohim just simply means like God of gods, force of forces, like the one who's over all of the other gods. Like there's this big universal idea of who God is. But by the time we get to Genesis 12, it's really personal. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. We're talking about the same God who created all things, but also we're talking about a God that you can name. Because when you can begin to name things, you can begin to connect with things. It's not just the universe or energy or power that's out there. And I'm down for, all, for a broader understanding of spiritual journey. But it's this idea that there's going to come a moment. There's going to come a place in your life where you want to hold something, touch something, feel something, smell something, taste something. And you want to be held. And you want to be comforted. And you want to experience something beyond yourself. And so Genesis 12, you have to think about this. This is thousands of years old in a world where people thought about gods in a way that was incredibly distant and the gods were petty and mean and angry. 
And in this story that's 3,500 years old at at a minimum is a story about a God who intervenes in time to an anti-hero, an old man who had no kids, which is a way of saying in the ancient world, somebody who didn't have a future, who was hopeless, who was lost, who figured that things weren't gonna work out for him and his family. That this God was personal and in that moment speaks to Abraham and Sarah. And the story is all about this reality that what if God has a voice in our life? What if the way that we experience freedom is that we begin to hear what God is saying to us? And as we think about freedom, we need to think about some things that we want freedom from. And I love how the story goes. It says this, that what God says is, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Think about it from an ancient perspective. Leave everything that you know. Leave everything that might be working for you. This isn't like 2022 where you can just like move across the country, like get a credit card, finance some new things, meet some friends on social media. It's like get on a donkey with some camels, no Google Maps, right? (laughs) I can barely get to like downtown without my uh, my iPhone. And it's this idea of if you want freedom, what does it look like to leave all of these other voices that have been in your life? And what if some of these voices have been limiting you? And I believe that we all carry around voices from our past. And this is all the story is saying, that God has a fresh voice for you and where you're going now. That God wants to bring you freedom and God is going to lead you somewhere. In order for God to lead you somewhere, God also needs to talk about the things that are currently weighing you down. And for Abram, it was leave your family of origin. Again, this isn't a universal story for everybody. It's trying to create a powerful narrative for where Abram was going. But I connect with that. Anybody have any pain with their family of origin? Yeah, a few of us. Anybody have any pain from just old narratives of people that told, that, of your past, of just voices that people told you. And those narratives just keep running in your head. And that's who you are and that's what you think about. Anybody have any pain of just systems and institutions? Yeah, anybody have any pain of things like addiction? Anybody have any pain of things like anxiety and fear and worry? Things that just feel so beyond ourselves. And imagine what the story is saying is that God has a voice and wants to speak into your life, and God's also just trying to name the things maybe that have encumbered you in some way. I think about it like this, right? For me, the huge bag that I carry around is my family of origin. It pains me. It's heavy. I think about it all of the time. I haven't talked with my parents in six years. I started a church that I thought was gonna bring freedom to other people, and my mom is a fundamentalist family, and they send me text messages that says, I'm taking people to the second lake of fire. Talk about a good time on Thanksgiving. Yeah. 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 And there's just pain that I carry around there. And I remember thinking about the voices of when I was going to start New Abbey. And I remember telling my old church what I was going to do. And I remember everybody saying, oh, that's not going to work out. Right? There's a formula for how you do church in evangelicals and megachurch America. Right? I don't know. I said, what, what if what we're doing is not what people need? What if we don't need better answers? What if we don't need better programs? What if we don't need lasers and lights? I'm not saying those things are bad. Like seriously, praise God for a lot of those other churches. Most of you come from those other churches and I praise God for the leaders that they've already made in you. You might be carrying around some baggage and some wounds, but there's good stuff that happened to you there as well. And I praise God for that, seriously. But I remember thinking about what would it be like just to have a place where you can ask bigger conversations? What would it be like to to have a place where like, we just don't fit into this theological box that you're providing us? What if there's just a larger narrative at play here for who God is, for what Jesus could be, what faith means in a place like Los Angeles in 2022? I remember sitting with some leaders from that church and them telling me, we just want you to know that less than 1% of churches make it after three years, so you're just probably gonna fail, Corey. And I just had those voices in me. I remember when I left a church of thousands of people where I was speaking five Sundays, right? And my 26-year-old self was like, I am awesome. (laughs) And then starting New Abbey with 10 people in my living room and being depressed for 18 months because everything that I measured my success by was now gone. I remember in those moments having to go back to therapy. I remember in those moments realizing, oh, the addictions that I've been running from for so long, now they're here and I had to get into 12-step groups. I remember being in 12-step groups and hearing different voices and hearing vulnerability and authenticity in a way that I'd never heard in the world of church before, where everybody showed up with no pretenses because they've all already fallen flat on their faces. 
And so I remember carrying all of this baggage around. I remember for me, for some of you, right? Baggage everywhere. Uh, <laughs> systems and institutions that we've all just been pained by things that just feel completely out of our control. That for the rabbis, they talk about this story this way, that when God calls Abram, one of the things that God is calling Abram to is God is calling Abram to let go of victimhood. And isn't it interesting that rabbis are saying that the Jewish people who has literally been victimized by every major empire the world has ever seen, that the rabbis are saying, if we allow ourselves to continue to be victims, we're never gonna take responsibility to create in the world that God wants for us. I've always found that incredibly powerful because the rabbis say this, yes, we have been victims and we will name that. This is not one of those stories of just pretend that never happened to you. No, heal and name all of those things that have been happened to you, but don't let victimhood rule you and take your life away from you. And it leads us into another area of responsibility of, yeah, those things may have been out of your control, but how do we leave some of that baggage behind so that we can go into a new land, create a new reality, create a new perspective? Because what it means to be human, unfortunately, is that personally and society, most of us have been victims to something. And we all carry that weight around in a different way. That for some of us, it's stories like worry and anxiety for some of us, it's, oh my gosh, does this one sneak up at you at 2 a.m. when you feel like Netflix was gonna put you to sleep and it didn't and you just keep thinking about all of those stories? Or am I alone? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Oh, addiction. This one plagued my life since I was 12 years old. Oh, and then I just lived in shame of it and fear of it, but really what was going on, I was just trying to care for myself. I didn't know how to, so I coped. And those voices just stuck with me. And it wasn't about whatever the thing is, right? Everyone who's ever gone to Alcoholics Anonymous, Sex Addicts Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, you name the thing, you eventually find out, oh, it has nothing to do with alcohol or the drugs or the whatever. There's a deeper wound here. I just go to this thing to care for myself. And then everyone's favorite, fill in the blank, because we all got shit people, right? <laughs> but this is what we look like. We're like, I have a vision for my life. Yeah, I'm just walking around. Let's go. How are you doing, Corey? I'm good. How are you? Yeah. And where's like a big like jumpsuit that just says global pandemic, right? Yeah. And this is how we look like. We're just walking through life with this stuff. Voices upon voices and narratives upon narratives, stories loaded within us about who we can't be or who we ought to be. And we know that there's a bigger story of freedom that's out there. And it just feels heavy, but we're just so accustomed to it. We're just so accustomed to juggling it and we're tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. I realized I was yelling at you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm yelling because I'm tired and I'm worn out sometimes. And this is either a story about 3,500 years ago, God spoke into humanity and to Abram and said, hey, leave all of those things behind and go into something else. Or this is a story that can be offered to every single human being. It says, hey, we all got something back there. That's just the way that it is. It's not gonna be magically removed from you. But this is God speaking in and saying, yeah, I can name all those things, right? We can name all this stuff. And here's the part about it. This is the, like the, the small nuance for me from like the evangelical days. It's not just Jesus comes in, takes the bag and whatever dance they're doing or something like that. You know, this would be good. But it's a story of, no, it's all still in the room with me. I just get to pack it up neatly. And as I grow and as I evolve and as I find more freedom, sometimes I open up those bags again and I'm like, ugh. Man, I have, I have more to learn here. But I don't have to carry it around every day. I know where it's at. I'm not pretending like it's not in the attic or even just like neatly in my closet. So if I need to access it and be like, there's my mom again. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I can have freedom over it in a different way. And so the story moves on that we go from not only the things that we need to move from, from, but also the things that we need to move for. And I think that's a different kind of freedom. That in, for many of us, we spend so much energy and time thinking about the things that we want to move from. Uh, and, and a lot of times, uh, most of what I would call evangelical theology was about the things that you're trying to escape from. You're trying to escape, again, from hell. You're trying to escape from bad things. And a lot of times, even in progressive ideology, a lot of times we're talking about all the isms that we want to move from. But what we haven't created is a new imagination of what we can be about and for. There are houses that we should burn down. There are things that we should abolish. There are things that we should reform. There are places that we need to evolve from. 
But in order to do that, we can't spend all of our energy in just talking about the things that we need to move from. We need to be able to name the things that we're moving for. And so after it says, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you, that word go is incredibly powerful. In the Hebrew, it's this word, lake, leka. Say, lake, leka with me. Lake, leka is this word that has so much deep meaning and richness within it. And it's a word of journey to yourself. Oh, what a different way of seeing it. Go, which means journey to yourself. Journey to yourself to this new place. That there's not only gonna be, there's gonna be an exterior journey that you go on, but the reality of it is an internal journey of transformation and healing that you'll be on the entire time. That's where God's gonna speak to you in new ways. This is where God's gonna bring you a different kind of freedom. And in this story of freedom about what you're moving for, as you find healing here, as you create a new imagination for who you can be, as you figure out whatever that promised land that you're moving into, the things that you want and dream of and desire for your life, because you're a human being, and of course you do, that as you actually attain those things, and as you actually find those things, and as you live those things out, the magic of it will be when you begin to offer that blessing to other people as well. I love how the story goes, and it goes like this. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. Just close your eyes a minute. How many of us simply want better voices in our lives? How many of us would just simply want the voice of God in our life? And that the voice of God is, there's not the shame and the guilt and all of the other stuff that we used to think of. It's not a God playing games with you. But what if the words that were spoken thousands of years ago are so true of us? What if God just says, oh, I, I simply want to make you into something great? I want to bless you. Oh, excuse me. The words of the Bible are way better than the words I said. Not I want to, I will bless you. And if you can move away from hashtag, hashtag blessed and everything you've seen on social media, what if it's just beautiful and it's richer, that there's just simply a God who's for me? And there's a God who's with me. And there's a God who's ahead of me. And not only do I want to bless you, I will bless those who bless you. I will make your name great. And through the blessing that I give to you, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What a different type of freedom that I want to have in life. Isn't that juxtaposed to carrying all of this stuff around because that's just what it means to be human? To, oh no, I'm gonna see my life in a different way, that there's different voices that I can have for myself of, what if there's goodness that's flowing out of me? What if God is blessing me? What if God is doing great things and good things through me? And what if through that goodness and that greatness, I am going to impact and change the lives of other people around me? That's the story here, that God's gonna do God's part and then there's a responsibility in doing our part, that there's actions that we're gonna take. And we know those actions and we repeat them all the time, right? Have some self-awareness, do some intake, go to therapy, surround yourself with people who are healthy. You will look like the people that you surround yourself with, right? Um, find a faith community, get a spiritual director. There's endless resources. Good books are, are, are able, there's a lot of good books out there for you to find. We'll help you with those. Pray. I was talking to somebody the other day and he's like, I haven't been to church for seven years and I just don't know where to begin. I'm like, what if you just say to God, I'm here. He's like, where do I start in the Bible? I'm like, I, later, get to it. What if you're just saying, God, I'm here and I need something beyond myself? And that the freedom that we need is a freedom of what we're actually moving towards. I almost forgot about Encanto. I love Encanto because it's the first Disney movie that I've seen in a long time, maybe ever, where there's no dark antagonist out there. The only antagonist is themselves. The only antagonist is the narratives that they have with them. That they were legitimately victim to something horrific if you've seen the movie. But the story is now not becoming in a victimhood mindset because it will limit them and will limit who their family can be. That they're worried about fear and if they're worried about all these other things that will prevent it, that they're not going to actually enjoy the life that they have. It's about embracing and seeing who others are that when they become healthy, that when they become transformed, that they begin to not only see who they are and the best of what they bring, there's an anti-hero in that story, right? Somebody who doesn't have all of the magic. If you haven't seen this, you're like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. That's fine. 
But you will watch it eventually, and you'll see, like, oh, who the hero is is the person who didn't have all the gifts. And reminded everyone else of why their gifts were so special. And that's the story. That sometimes our greatest enemy is with them. And sometimes the greatest stories that we have is that when we find transformation, that when we find healing, that when we find new voices within ourselves, then we have the ability to offer other beautiful voices as well to remind them of how God is working in their life. And so I'm going to end with this. This is all in the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is a story about faith is freedom and moving us in this direction. The story of Jesus is, did you know that Jesus never once asked you to believe in him? That Jesus only asked you to follow him. Jesus never asked you to worship him, I should say. Sorry, he only says, follow me. That Jesus isn't looking for people who just stand at a distance and raise their hands and hope that the world magically gets better. Jesus invites people to follow in a different way, to take responsibility and that God will do God's part. Jesus is inviting us into a different freedom where it doesn't work out for a few people, but the story of kingdom works out for everybody. It's a new reality and perspective for all of humanity. Jesus didn't come to create Christians. Jesus came to reconcile all of creation. It's a much bigger narrative. That the story of death and resurrection is a story of God coming in and saying, I'm not just going to suffer for you because for some reason you're bad. It's a story of I'm going to suffer with you because you're all carrying baggage. And that in the story of suffering with you, Jesus will provide us a new path and a new way forward. And we call that thing resurrection. In the world of resurrection, the powerful piece of the Easter story is this, that when Jesus comes out of the tomb, nothing changed. Pontius Pilate was still Pontius Pilate. Caesar was Caesar. The colors weren't any different. All the people that betrayed him had still betrayed him. But the reality is that the perspective of what Jesus brings into the world has changed. And now it's our invitation to go change the world as we see it now. Because we've been through all of our suffering. We've experienced it all. We've dealt with it in some way. And now we have the freedom to live in a new way as well. That these stories of faith that we've collected for thousands of years, the reason that we're doing this journey through the Torah in 2022 is just to remind ourselves that they still have some oomph to them. They still have the ability to transform us, that they were revolutionary thousands of years ago and they're still revolutionary within us today. And it is now our job to write the next chapter. If you would get into those same groups, we're gonna ask you this question with one another. What do you want freedom for? Enjoy. Enjoy.